So, a uh, welcome in jazz meeting here in Enschede. Um, well, um, just want to know um, who is jo uh, Jeff Lorber? When did he fell in love with the instrument? Well, I was very lucky because um, my mother was a piano player, mm -hmm. and she played a lot, yes. and she played very well. Mm -hmm. She mostly kind of romantic music like Debussy. Um, you know, uh, what else, um, Gershwin, mm -hmm. um, and I would go to sleep every night and hear her play. Oh, that's, that's And I, I loved it. Yes. And just as a l real, real little mm -hmm. kid, I would like sit under the piano and listen to yeah. her. And also I had two older sisters that were studying piano too. They didn't really stick with it, mm -hmm. but they played too. So everybody was having f so much fun yeah. playing music. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to, uh, Get in on it. <laughs> and so I start playing very young. I start mm -hmm. taking lessons at four. At four. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, always, uh, I was more talented, like, using my ear mm -hmm. than reading, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm still working on reading to this day. Yes. <laughs> I'm still trying to be a good reader. Um, and, um, uh, that, you know, there was just, like, at that time, there was a lot of music around. There was a lot of great mm -hmm. music on the radio, of course. In the well, '60s, and I, and I had cousins that were into into music too. We had a kind of a big family that mm -hmm. used to get together a lot. Most of my cousins were into folk music. Okay. They liked kind of like Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. I had a sister mm -hmm. that was really into Bob Dylan and that kind of stuff. I didn't really like that okay. at Why the time. Not? I mean, I, not not that much. Okay. So and uh, when, when did you find? But I had a cousin that was yes. into jazz though. Okay. And we would go over to his house, mm -hmm. and he had a drum set downstairs, and he would he would let me play the drums. Mm -hmm. And so little kids, they love to play drums. It's like really fun, you know, they make mm -hmm. a bunch of noise, it's great. <laughs> and he was into, uh, he gave me, actually I remember he gave me three records. And one was, um, well the, the most important one was Monk's Dream. Mm -hmm. That's the one I played over and over and really fell in love with. The other two were, um, it was Andre Previn playing My Fair Lady oh, okay. with a tri yeah. piano trio. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a nice record. I still kind of listen to that once in a while. And the other one was a little bit too, too adult for me. It was um, McCoy Tyner, oh, yeah. um, Ballads and Blues was mm -hmm. the name of it, Impulse. It was an Impulse record. And I couldn't, couldn't appreciate that. I just wasn't too young to appreciate that. But um, I listened to the Monk record over and over, and I just loved it so much. And, so um, one of your heroes. And so, yeah, and so, um, and then an another really great thing that happened to me was when, when and, and I started playing in bands when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And actually my first instrument that I played in a band was guitar, because I didn't have enough money to, to buy a, um, an organ, because they mm -hmm. were a lot more expensive. You could get a guitar for like a couple hundred, for a yes. hundred dollars mm -hmm. or something like that, and an amp. And an organ was like five hundred dollars yes. or a thousand dollars or something. So uh, I mean, I, I and I still play guitar. I'm mm -hmm. not I'm not great, but I can play yeah. you know some simple funk kind of blues. Mm -hmm. I play kind of blues. I really like it yes. though. I really like playing guitar. Yes. And then, but anyway, what happened to me that that was that was really important besides mm -hmm. everything else was I met um, one summer. I went away and I was part of this sort of educational experiment yes. that the state of Pennsylvania was doing, and I met mm -hmm. some people that lived farther out in the country, and they were really into blues. Yes. And so I ended up playing with them. I think mm -hmm. I, was, I was probably like 13 or 14. They were like 16 or 17 or something like that. So many influences. And, uh, but, you know, uh, well, I was playing keyboards yes. at the time. Then I, then I, I, I had some kind of a keyboard instrument yes. to play. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that, that was important because mm -hmm. I, I really love the blues and that's a really big part of my music. Yes. And, um, so, and so at that time it was like the Paul Butterfield Blues Band mm -hmm. was popular and I really liked them. And um, um, John Mayle and the mm -hmm. Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton on guitar. That, those were like probably our two most important um, things that we listened to. And uh, also um, the Blues Project, Mike Bloomfield, and um, and also, you know, it's funny because one of the one of the groups that I really liked was Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I like that. And I'm really good friends mm -hmm. with Bobby Columbi, who was mm -hmm. the founder of that group, and we've been friends for a number of years. But I started out as sort of a fan of his music. And uh, anyway, so there, there you have it. There's a little <laughs> little synopsis. <laughs> 
So uh, your highlight, because you are nominated several times, mm -hmm. and now you have a Grammy. Right. What does that mean to you? Well, honestly, um, it's, you know, I think the most important thing that, of what really means a lot yes. is having a career and being able to play, being able to come here and play okay. here for mm -hmm. this crowd and play your music. Yes. That means a lot. That means more than having a Grammy. I mean, a Grammy is good. That mm -hmm. kind of shows everybody that, you know, your peers think that you're a good musician. And but I think like the real the real goal mm -hmm. for me of a music for, for me in my life, and I think for a lot of guys, is to have a career yes. where you can continue mm -hmm. to be creative and you can continue to have fun playing music and and write new music and play new music and and you know bring it to different audiences. And of course, you know, a Grammy is something mm -hmm. that. It's like a sort of a seal of approval, so that's that's great. And um, but that's kind of the real the real goal right yeah. there is just to to have that freedom to to make music mm -hmm. um, as your way of life. And uh, and I could you know it's really really fun. I really well, just love it. It's the same answer when I ask you what means success to you. Right. Well, yeah. That's yes. it. That's it. Yes. Um, more dreams. Do you have more dreams? Uh, well, I'm just always really um, involved in music. I'm always listening to new music. You know, I, I think um, the age that we listen that we live in. You know, there's a lot of positive things in terms of um, the tools that we have are very powerful, and they allow you to mm -hmm. be creative anywhere you are, and you can you have access to really cool sounds and. You know, when I first started, if you wanted to record something, if you wanted to record, um, you know, my, my earliest recordings were on a 16-track tape machine, mm -hmm. which I thought was like, oh, like, we don't need all that. Who needs 16 tracks? That's too many. <laughs> yeah. No, really, my, early, my first album, most, mm -hmm. of, most of the songs were either eight or 12, between eight and 12 tracks. Mm -hmm. And now? Yeah. Now it's like 60, <laughs> 80, you know, but still, that's actually small mm -hmm. compared to, like, pop records. Yes. Pop records use mm -hmm. like hundreds, yeah. but um, but yeah. So when we first st did our first demos, um, you know we you know a, re a recording studio is mm -hmm. expensive. So I was lucky because I met a guy uh, who worked at a studio and he was learning how to engineer mm -hmm. and he invited me to come in and record stuff and just just for, you know so he could practice engineering and I could yeah. practice recording. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got started, and then I, I made a demo, and I sent the demo out to a few different labels, and one of the labels was um, a small independent company that was, that was, they actually had, you ever hear of a European label called Enja? It's a Scandinavian la label, I think they're out of uh, Denmark probably, mm. it's like from the 60s or something like that. Yeah. But this guy started importing those records, and then he just start, started signing a few acts, so I was lucky because I was one of his early acts that he signed. and. Um, the first record only sold locally. We were like a local band at yeah. the time I was living mm -hmm. in Portland, Oregon. And so we sold locally, but we sold a lot because we were lucky because there was, a, there was a guy that decided to promote the record and, um, and so we sold 8,000 copies wow. of the first record, which wow. at the time was, I mean, my budget was like practically mm -hmm. zero. So <laughs> that, was, that was sort of 8,000 8, times whatever they sold them for, like five or eight dollars or whatever it is. So that was like, what, $50,000 or something mm -hmm. for, the, for the record company. And um, so then when we made the second record, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the thing that really made a big difference was, um, so the sax player I had wasn't really, he wasn't really giving me what I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. at that time. So, because I had more money to spend, yeah. I decided to use Joe Farrell, the famous, you know, sax mm -hmm. player Joe Farrell, that was playing with Chick Corea. Yeah. And um, and I, I was a fan of Chick Corea, and I had had like some dialogue with him. He was a really nice guy. I wrote him some letters and mm -hmm. sent him some transcriptions, and he wrote back, and he was really great, mm -hmm. really nice guy. And I and I also like he, when he would come through town, I would meet him, and I met his manager, and mm -hmm. I called up his manager and asked. If uh, he could hook me up with Joe Farrell, yeah. which he did, and um, and then so I was about to go down to L.A. Mm -hmm. and record Joe Farrell, and I told the sax player in my band that um, hey, I'm going to use Joe Farrell on a couple of songs. 
on this record. And and he was he was he was upset, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said, um, well, "Why don't you use Chick Corea to play your parts?" <laughs> and I thought, "Yeah, that's a great idea. I should ask Chick to see if he'll play on the record." So I did that, yes. and Chick played on a couple of songs. Wow! <laughs> and um, and then so when the record came out, mm -hmm. it had those two guys on it, and they were at the height of their popularity. Yeah. So that was like sort of the days of early FM radio where mm -hmm. FM were kind of small stations yeah. that played like rock mm -hmm. and they played jazz. They played whatever they want, you know. It was, it was very different than it is now. And so we had kind of a hit, hit mm -hmm. uh, record with that, with that album. With, um, you know, they came across the desks of these guys at these radio stations mm -hmm. and it showed, you know, Jeff Lorber featuring Joe Farrell mm -hmm. and Chick Corea. It's like, yeah. wow, this must be good. <laughs> So there was a song that we had that was called Catherine that got a lot of airplay, mm -hmm. and um, and so and so after that, and and of course the record business was different then. Also, mm -hmm. it was very, you know, it was very successful compared to the way it is now. I mean, there were so many different labels all really competing with each mm -hmm. other, and they all had a lot of money to spend on jazz too, which was like a niche thing. Like nowadays, no major label mm -hmm. is that involved in jazz, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, so we had all these major labels that really wanted us. And um, we decided to go with Aris. The Clive Davis mm -hmm. came down to our show in New York, and he heard us play. And um, at the time, he had a lot of jazz on his label. He had um, the early GRP uh, label with Dave Grusin, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a lot of really nice things. They had the Brecker Brothers, which were... Yeah. Those guys, yeah. you know, grew up in my hometown, yeah. so that was pretty, and those guys were great. That first yeah, Brecker yeah. Brothers album was unbelievable. And they had a bunch of other stuff, so the, the other label that really wanted us was Capital, but Capital didn't really have that much going mm -hmm. on, so we decided to go, go, with, go with Arista. Mm -hmm. and, and I made six records for them, and um, one of the records, the third record, which was, which was called Water Sign, had a, I mean, uh, yeah, had a song on it called Rain Dance, mm -hmm. and Rain Dance, luckily for me has become sort of a hip-hop classic mm -hmm. where it's been sampled by a lot of hip-hop artists over over the years mm -hmm. the, the the original um, song that, that was very successful was um, a song called crush on you with notorious mm -hmm. big and little Kim but ever since then there's been a bunch of different yeah. people that have uh, sampled my stuff Jay-Z has yes. used some of my stuff um, yes. and like in the last couple weeks we had um, like, I don't know, like three or four different artists yeah. have called up and are, are mm -hmm. using that for the records. Uh, well, what does it to you? What does it to you? Well, when I mean, I think it's great because, yeah. um, well, first of all, it helps me survive because yeah. it's good financially. Mm -hmm. But besides that, it sort of introduces my music to a whole new generation yeah. of fans. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the way, the way it works is because the original thing was like, probably almost 20 years ago, like the, the notorious big thing, it kind of goes in cycles. And then sometimes like you don't hear anything for a long time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it becomes like the thing again. Yes. So that's... What do you want to say to, the, to this generation? Because it's very hard, it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. Well, I listen to this generation's music. I'm listening yeah. to what they're doing. And... Um, so I'm trying to learn from what they're doing too, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to be relevant to uh, and take some some of the stuff that I hear that mm -hmm. from from the pop music that's out there, and maybe incorporate that into uh, my music. But mm -hmm. I, I I'd say, like I mean, from what you heard tonight, yeah. like that's a really good example mm -hmm. of um, combines a little bit of like virtuoso mm -hmm. playing with grooves that are very mm -hmm. funky and very kind of fun to yeah. to to tap your foot to kind of danceable mm -hmm. f you know fun um rhythmically yeah. that sort of like mm -hmm. r and b based quite a bit and some of it's latin based yes. and, um, latin. but mm -hmm. but it's a combination of uh and then melodies that i think are memorable i hope yeah. and are um fun to listen to mm -hmm. that kind of tie the thing together and then um I know it's just all the elements you hear, the, the harmony and the melody and the form and the, the way the band interacts yes. and everybody takes Enjoy a solo the and there's just a lot of different things yeah. going on. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, I mean, if I have anything to say to the younger generation, mm -hmm. it would just be like, I, I, w I wish they could 
have you know, a little more harmonic interest in their music. And, um, you know, they, they kind of missed growing up the way we grew up, which mm -hmm. was where we had to, in a way, we had to work a lot harder yeah. to have mm -hmm. access to music and to develop our talent. And they, they have some, some, the technology kind of makes it easier to just it's really easily, easy, really right? fast to, yes. to make, make mm -hmm. music. So, um, so you know, so may maybe some of, some of, and there are some young musicians that are out there that are very talented, yeah. that are really great. I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of uh, Jacob Collier mm -hmm. and of Snarky Puppy, yeah. and um, you know, every day I hear more and more. You know, I mean, another thing is we had produce. You know, I didn't have personally. I didn't have a lot of producers, but a lot of the because I ended up producing a lot of stuff yeah, myself. I but I think our the earlier era of instrumental artists had mm -hmm. producers, worked with producers, worked with record companies that mm -hmm. would guide the artists. And that seems to be missing now. Yeah. And I think that's unfortunate. You know, so um, some of these guys, they have talent and they're allowed to, to express themselves and they're allowed to do whatever they want. They would do well to collaborate with other people that can help yeah. focus, focus on what they're doing and yeah. make it... Um, uh, just even better than what they could come up with mm -hmm. themselves. Like I work with Jimmy a lot yeah. uh, as like a co-producer mm -hmm. because I like having that other um, opinion. You know, mm -hmm. so I play stuff for Jimmy, and you know, sometimes he gets really excited about <laughs> stuff, and yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, like yeah. work on that, and then other times he goes like, mm -hmm. "Not, nah, you know, like that one's not as good as some other mm -hmm. stuff we have." You know, so it's I really I really appreciate that collaboration. And uh, so that's that's something that works mm -hmm. really well. Okay, a final question because <laughs> you have a lot to share. Mm -hmm. um, your mission? Do you have a mission with your music um, and what you have experienced in all those years with music? Well, I guess I guess what I do is I um, I synthesize all all these elements and mm -hmm. then I create something new. So that's that's kind of my mission, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and then you know as time goes on, you look back at what you, what you've done, mm -hmm. and some of it holds up really well, and maybe some of it doesn't hold up yeah. as well. But um, I mean, I just really uh, I just feel very lucky to be doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. and have these opportunities, and I hope I can just continue, and I and I hope it. I hope that um, I continue to make things that that have lasting value mm -hmm. that that people appreciate. Because we live in a world where, um, I mean, it used to be like when people put a record out, it has to be you have to compete with your with your peers and mm -hmm. with your you know the other records that are coming out. Mm -hmm. But now you have to you now you have to compete with the history of recorded music yeah. <laughs> because. Um, you know, why sound like Led Zeppelin? You could just listen to Led Zeppelin all day. You don't have to sound like Led Zeppelin. There already is Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So why do that? You know, you don't have to do that. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to compete with the history of recorded music. So that, because everybody has, like their phone, they have mm -hmm. like the history of recorded music on their phone. Yeah. And um, so that's, that's, that's tougher. Yeah. So I hope I can, I can, do, I can uh, compete with the history of recorded music. And uh, contribute something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jeff Rob, I want to thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Um, thank you. I wish you love, luck, and happiness. Thank you. And of course, good health. Thank you. And make a lot of music to, uh, yeah. to give the energy to, uh, thank you. to the, this world. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.